So let's begin by jumping into Jonah chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. I love these next two words. It says, Jonah obeyed. Nice call, Jonah. I think the fish the week before that we talked about last week kind of got his attention. So instead of running, these two words apply. It says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king of his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So in Jonah chapter 1, we see Jonah running from God. In Jonah chapter 2, we see Jonah running to God. In Jonah chapter 3, we're going to see Jonah running with God. And throughout this chapter, there's a big idea that you're going to see as a thread throughout the message. It's something that uh, that applies to Jonah. It's something you'll see begin to take place in the people of Nineveh, even the king himself. And it's something that you'll see take place in the life of a Christ follower the more we submit ourselves to Christ. The big idea you're going to see as a thread through this chapter is this. Humility touches the heart of God. Humility touches God the heart of God. Even outside of the book of Jonah, the Bible is full of scriptures that point to the blessing that comes with humility and the distaste, actually disdain, God has for pride and arrogance. I'm going to read some scriptures. I just want you to hear the ideas behind each one. James chapter 4 and verse 10. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Psalm 149 and verse 4 says, For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Psalm 147 verse 6, it says, The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Psalm 21 and verse 24, I'm sorry, Proverbs 21 and 24, it says, The proud and arrogant person, mocker is his name, behaves with insolent fury. Proverbs 16 and verse 5 says, The Lord detests all the proud of heart, but, sure, but be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Proverbs 16 and verse 19 says, Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share the plunder of the proud. James chapter 4 and verse 6 says, But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5 says, All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. If God were picking a team, the characteristic to be picked on his team is humility. And I don't care what the sport or what the event, if God is picking a team, I want to be on his team. God loves humility. And if humility is a sweet smell, if it's a perfume in God's nostrils, then pride and arrogance are like B.O. And the worst thing about B.O. is you usually don't know you have it. Everyone else around you knows it. (laughs) Pride and arrogance are actually a stench. God is opposed to the proud. He's opposed to the arrogant. And with that understood, with that big idea in mind, let's look now at Jonah chapter 3. The first thing that we see in the first two verses of Jonah is that people are more important to God than comfort zones. People are more important to God 
than comfort zones. Uh, verses 1 and 2 say, says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Many times our God stories, the times when we look and we say God did something incredible, those stories happen at the points in our lives when we are being stretched, when we are outside of our comfort zones. And as someone told me last week after this service, if your last God story, if your last God moment is more than three months old, then it's time to stretch. It's time to go beyond your comfort zone. God will stretch you. He will make you uncomfortable. God will put you around sandpaper people who are going to rub you the wrong way. He is going to mess up your box. Comfort zones are not God's highest priority in our lives. God is not an airline stewardess. Would you like a drink? Would you like a snack? Do you need a pillow? Would you like a blanket that's this big? Are you comfortable? I don't see that in Scripture. He cares far more about our character than he does our comfort. And he cares far more about people than keeping us in a safe zone, keeping us comfortable. Now, please hear this. God is good. God is good. But God being good does not mean that he's soft. My parents to me, when I was growing up, my parents were good to me. But in no way does that mean they were soft. God is good, but he is not soft. So when we find ourselves in that place where we're going, Lord, I just want to be available to you. God, I just want to be used for your kingdom. But Monday night football is about to start, so can we block that window? And, you know, I kind of like my mealtimes to be alone, so can we block that window? And, you know, I like to go out with my friends on Friday night, so that, that square is kind of blocked on my calendar. Lord, on Thursday between 2 and 2.30, I'm yours. We set this comfort zone. We set this box. And God loves to blow our box up. See, we're afraid of being seen as radical we want God to use us in a way that's normal. Normal. I can hear Jonah saying to God, Lord, I'm a prophet for you. I'll speak for you. I'll say what you want me to say. But can I do it in Israel? That's my hometown. Those are my people. I know them. I've done it there before. All the other prophets get to stay in Israel. How come I have to go to Nineveh? Have you seen those people? They're mean. Can't I stay in Israel and stay in my box in my comfort zone? Lord, can I stay in a place where I can go to my own bed at night? Can't I be normal? What's normal? Who's normal? Is your life standard? Is my life standard? Is that normal? Are you normal? Just take kind of a sideways peek at the person beside you. Are they normal? Where do we get this idea of the box? What's normal? I would love to kind of do preacher normal sometimes. Preach one message, three points, nice little poem. Sing a nice safe song at the end that everybody knows. Go home, eat lunch, watch the game, fall asleep on the couch one time. Get up, maybe have a meeting during the week, play some golf. I'm a horrible golfer. So that's not gonna I would love to do normal. Four services, taking the time and the resources to go downtown to reach a new group of people. It's not normal. It's not a comfort zone. But God cares more about people than comfort zones. Our normal, biblically, should be a place of surrender. If we're followers of Jesus, then our normal begins to look more like a book in the Bible called the book of Acts. It's the actions of the first century church. Let me pose it to you this way. Let's make this practical. Let me throw it out this way. What if your normal was to talk to someone the first moment you felt like God was stirring on you? Have the conversation with them. Talk with them. What if your new form of normal was when you saw someone in need or you saw someone who was in a place of, of, of lack and God said to you, give to them. 
they need it more than you do. Or maybe they don't. They just need the encouragement that someone cares. What if that became our new normal? What if normal was the moment you saw someone and God said to you, they needed prayer? You would go up to them and maybe you don't know them. Maybe they don't look safe. Maybe God is stretching your box to say it's a time to ditch the normal. What if you just walked up and said, listen, you know, I don't know you, uh, don't know what's going on, but hey, I just wanted to ask, is there anything I can pray for you about? Is there anything I can pray with you about? What if that became the normal of the church? What if we blew up our little box and had a new view of normal? That's the Bible, biblical example for a Christian, a Christ follower, of normal. Tell the person beside you, there's no need to be normal. God stretches us because he loves us and he loves others. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not die, but you'll have eternal life. God doesn't do this to make us feel awkward. He does it because he cares more about people than our comfort zones. God did not quit on Jonah. The first part of that first verse says God came to Jonah a second time. He didn't quit after Jonah didn't listen the first time. He stuck with him because God cared for Jonah and he cares for the people of Nineveh. God does not quit on us. And here's the good news. He hasn't quit on you. Some of you have kept the Lord, kept him at a, a nice, safe distance. So if you ever need him, you can open the God box and you can pray a prayer and you can call the genie out. But God wants to go far beyond that. He wants to destroy your box. He has not quit on your kids. Those of you who are praying for your children or your parents, he hasn't quit on them. So we shouldn't either. God loves people. He's crazy about us. That's why He'll consistently challenge us on behalf of others to step outside of our comfort zone. And as we step out, I, remind you, I want to remind you of this. This is the next blank. and We've had this conversation before. Faithfulness is ours. Results belong to God. Faithfulness is ours. Results belong to God. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 3. It says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. God doesn't say, okay, here's the message. I want to see this bottom line. I want to see these results. No, he says, just go and be faithful. Take the message I've given you and be faithful with it. It's the same call, the same challenge he gives each one of us. Faithfulness is ours. Results belong to God. There are so many times in our lives where God's calling us into a situation that we're scared to death of that he's already begun working in. Maybe it's the person on your job that you think, oh, I'm afraid to talk to them. But you don't realize that they have a mama or a brother and sister or friends or a neighbor who's already started talking to them about the Lord, who's already started talking to them about what Jesus means to life. You come along. You're part of the process. Be faithful in your season, in your part. It may be someone at school or within your family. Maybe you're the first person in the process. But God will bring other people along the line. Faithfulness is ours. Results are God's. Nineveh, as a nation, may have been more willing, more open to Jonah's message because some things that had happened in their very recent past before Jonah shows up. In 765 B.C., there's a plague that hits Nineveh hard. It has a, a, a long-lasting toll. takes an effect on the country. In 763 B.C., there's a solar eclipse over the entire city. Now, when you're a people who are very superstitious and worshiping all sorts of God of the sky, of the seas, of the fields, of, of the rocks, of the trees, and all of a sudden you're watching an eclipse go on, it gets your attention. Three years after that, there's another plague that ravishes Nineveh. So now all of a sudden, they're kind of peaked. What's going on here? On the scene steps Jonah. Story is, he was swallowed by a fish and spit out by a fish. And he comes with this message from the God of all gods, bigger than the sky God or the sea God or the land God. He comes with a message for the people. And he says, listen, guys, you got to straighten up. you got 40 days or it's not going to be good. 
But he also brings the message, as we saw in Jonah chapter 2, that there's a God who saves. There's a God who's available to you, and it's that God who has sent me here to you today that has said, you need to turn, but forgiveness is available. And that's our next point. God is merciful and gives opportunities to repent. He's merciful and gives opportunities to repent. Verses 7 through verse 10. It's a, and then the, um, it says, this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so they will not perish. That's exactly what happens. Nineveh repents, and repents, a big Bible word, it literally means to turn. So if you're walking away from God, everything you're doing in your life is pointing away from God, and you're heading in the wrong direction, to repent means to stop, to turn, and to go back toward him. That's what repent means, plain and simple. If you're rebelling against God, you know who he's called you to be, what he's called you to be. If you know what Christ did for you on the cross and you're like, that's nice, let's keep it over here for a later date for when I really need it. If you're walking away from God, his call to us, just as it was to Nineveh, is to stop, repent, turn, and go back. And what the Bible tells us is that when we do this, God offers forgiveness. His forgiveness is available. When Nineveh repents, for the next 150 years, they stand as a city until they turn their back again on God and the Babylonians come in and wipe them out. God's forgiveness is available. God is a God of justice. Make no mistake about it. God is a God of justice and he's a God of mercy. He's the lion and he's the lamb. And God absolutely responds to those who respond in like. The prophet Micah said it this way in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He says, God has shown us what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What, how does God want us to act? It says to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. God's merciful and gives us opportunities to repent. God's justice is in perfect balance with his mercy. And his mercy looks in the mirror and sees a reflection, sees life in justice. They go hand in hand. Throughout scripture and throughout history, we see this to be true. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, it says, if my people, God speaking, he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. God's forgiveness is available, and the same is true to us today because of what Jesus did. When we ask for forgiveness, when we turn, when we repent from our rebellion against God, he brings healing spiritually because of what Jesus has done for us. God is merciful and loving and gives people the chance to surrender and repent. He responds to our humility and repentance. In 1904, in Wales, there was a group of young men who began praying. They were all coal miners. So they would work the mines in the day, and they began praying at night, and they began to pray asking God for a revival in Wales. The prayer that they prayed every night was, Lord, bend us. Bend us. Make us flexible. Make us available to you. God, bend us. The coal miners continued to pray, and a, a, one of the young men, his name was Evan Roberts, began speaking during these prayer times. And God gave him the message. It's the same message that Jonah speaks. It's the same message of the prophets throughout Scripture. It's the same message as revivalists throughout our history. It's the same message he would speak to us today. There's four points to it. First of all, confess all known sin. 
receiving forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Secondly, remove anything in your life that you're in doubt of or feel unsure about as far as how it reflect, uh, affects your relationship with Jesus. Thirdly, be ready to obey the Holy Spirit instantly. And then fourthly, publicly confess the Lord Jesus Christ. This message went out throughout Wales. The prayer went on, Lord, bend us. Make us flexible. Make us available and usable in your hands. It was a message of surrender to Christ and a humility that touched God's heart. And on October 31st, 1904, in Moriah Chapels in Wales, Evan Roberts, at 26 years old, asked God, give us 100,000 of our countrymen. Give us 100,000 people who will say yes to Jesus. And in two years, it, that, they accomplished that and more. That revival that started in that small dot on the globe spread throughout the world. God, bend us. Let us be available. Let us take your grace and your mercy to those around us. May we be humble and realize it's not us, it's you. God, bend us. It changed Wales. Documentation says that in those two years, police reported there was almost no criminal activity at all. The bars in this area of Wales, this coal mining, factory, hardcore area of this country, most shut down, many lost most all of their business. And my favorite account of this is the pit ponies or the pit mules that they used to use to drag the coal out of the coal mines. They stopped working because the miners' charges, their miners' commands to the mules were so laced with curse words and profanity that when they came to Christ and changed their language, the mules didn't know what to do. The mules stopped working. God, bend us. Bend us. May we be available to you. May our normal not matter. May our comfort zone, may our box not be where we live.